Today we shall look at the problem of designing embedded systems. In next few classes we shall go through the different processes and different issues which are involved in designing embedded systems. The design task basically starts by defining the system functionality and the design process leads to translating this functionality to physical implementation, satisfying the constraints which may be expressed in the form of variety of matrix in terms of performance, power consumption, etc. and other design matrix, optimizing other design matrix. So, you should understand the difference between the two, two aspects. One is when we specify the constraint, a design is not acceptable until and unless the constraint gets satisfied. That means, if we say that the data acquisition should be done within a time period of 40 millisecond, then that is a constraint and that constraint has to be satisfied by the system. Similar constraint can come from the requirements of power consumption. On the other hand, there would be few parameters which you would like to optimize, which may not have a constraint explicitly specified. And when I get a design for which these parameters are better optimized, obviously I shall prefer the design over another. So, for example, we may have two designs which satisfy the timing constraints, but for one design the energy requirement or energy consumption profile may be less compared to other, then obviously we shall prefer the design for which energy consumption profile is more attractive. Obviously, designing embedded systems turns out to be a complex problem simply because it has got complex functionality and we have to look at these constraints as well as optimization issues. So, the concerns of the design are architecture and related to the architecture comes in the performance. Obviously, the architecture is also related to what we call concurrency, what are the concurrent processes because for an embedded system, the need for concurrency comes from concurrency of the physical phenomena. Okay. So, how the concurrency has to be actually modeled and if they are to be modeled, then depending upon their periodicity as well as the deadlines associated, we need to formulate proper scheduling policy. Okay. And based on that scheduling policy, we shall be using variety of resources. Now, all these things are linked not in a general purpose sense, they are linked via the application requirements. So, the determination of architecture, its performance constraints, concurrency model, scheduling issues and availability of resources and use of resources, all these things are basically determined by the application. In fact, these aspects of the design clearly distinguishes your the problem of designing your embedded system from that of a general purpose computer. So, what will be the development process? Since we have found the application as a binding force, it has to start with requirement analysis. So, the requirement analysis would cover two aspects, both functional as well as performance related requirements. This should be followed by systems analysis, where we break down the requirements into hardware components as well as the software components and based on that decide about the high level architecture and the overall control scheme for the embedded systems. And followed by that, you can have an object level analysis, where 
your each component identified at the system level that is architecture level should translate to individual objects. These objects can be purely software objects or these objects can be physical objects and with physical objects we can have wrap around softwares as well. So, basically when we are referring to these objects what we are referring to as are entities which comprises our architecture. These entities may have realization in terms of hardware or in terms of software. So, obviously these uh, leads to architectural design, but architectural design is not the end of it because it has to be packaged and delivered. So, mechanistic design also plays an important role okay? because how the product has to be packaged, whether the packaging will take care of the cooling requirements or not, whether packaging takes care of the space requirement for battery or not. So, all these mechanistic design aspects becomes important. Also when you are looking at embedding these device into an appliance, you have to look at the constraints that appliance imposes. Okay? So, putting all these things together you have the detailed design and where you can optimize the detailed design by making use of low level information. And finally, once the design specs are ready, design constraints are specified and you have made the basic design decisions in terms of your architecture, in terms of your objects that actually will form the architecture that has to be translated to an implementation. Okay? And once you have implementation that has to be subjected to testing and validation to verify the fact that you are meeting the requirements with which you started. So, let us understand this overall design process and the design challenges with reference to a conceptual model of an embedded system. In fact, this model we had already looked at earlier, I am just looking at it again to, to have references to various parameters which may turn out to be important. The key component is obviously a CPU. Okay? Along with the CPU, you have the memory. So, this part of it is CPU and the memory design is a very key component for the processing task. And your software has to satisfy the constraints of the system and be consistent with the CPU and the memory architecture that you have chosen. And you may require at times to map some of the elements to an ASIC, some of the processing tasks to an ASIC or an FPGA in order to meet maybe timing requirements. These are basically the interfacing issues or interfacing components with the external world to sense and to act. Okay? The actuators would modify the environment. This diagnostic port from the design point of view will provide you the facility of repairing as well as maintainability of the embedded system. And this electrical and mechanical backup and safety are important issues when really you have a device which controls maybe mechanical components. Okay? So, everything, everything has to be considered when you are looking at a system level design of an embedded system. It is just not the issue of CPU design, it is just not an issue of ASIC design it is just not an issue of mapping a hardware onto an FPGA. This holistic view is what is very important for us to understand in order to design an embedded appliance. So, what we say that in a desktop computing the design focuses on building first a CPU and then supporting it as required for maximum computing speed. So, we might like to design just a hardware circuit, 
okay, which may do the job fastest. But in embedded system, the interfaces play a very crucial role. Okay. So, external interfaces, the controller sequencing algorithms is of primary importance. Okay. And the CPU simply exists as a way to implement those functions. Okay. So, in that sense, your CPU design, although it is at the central point, is at the central point and is also a focal theme, but it is not the only thing. This is a very important issue. Okay. It is equally important to make choice of an appropriate sensors, make choice of appropriate actuators and look at the control laws and the processing tasks, the signal processing tasks which the embedded system is supposed to execute. And in fact, your choice of CPU should be guided by these factors only. So now, let us look at these design requirements or the design constraints. These requirements are not strictly requirement of an embedded appliance, but requirements that design should ideally satisfy. So, let first let us look at the processing element, which I said is a focal point. So, these processing elements have tight constraints on both functionality as well as implementation, because the processing element must guarantee real time operation reactive to external events. It should conform to size and weight limits. It should have props, uh, proper budgeting of power and cooling consumption, that is its cooling becomes also an important issue, should satisfy safety and reliability requirements and meet tight cost targets. So, choice of a processing element is therefore not a straightforward task. In many cases, you will not be designing a processing element, but you will be choosing a processing element. Okay? So, when you make a choice of the processing elements, fundamentally if it is a real time operation and if it needs to react to external events, the processing element should have the enough computational power to meet these constraints. But at the same time, your other factors are also of importance. Okay? It should not consume too much energy and it should not be possibly a costly processor. So, may you may like to balance out these factors. So, that is why the issue of uh, designing additional logic on an FPGA or using a special purpose IC for doing some task becomes important in the context of embedded system. Because if you are choosing a faster processor to meet all your timing constraints, you may be paying more for cost paying more for energy. Instead of that, you may choose a low end processor and for a special functionality with respect to which your processor is not being able to meet the timing constraint, use dedicated hardware. Okay? So, these balancing out act is a key issue for an embedded system design. The real time systems uh, when we are designing, they are the key issue is that of deadlines. So, obviously, the definition is that correctness of a computation depends in part on the time at which it is delivered. Now, how do you ensure that when you are designing that system? So, system design must take into account worst case performance. Typically, the design should be ideally with reference to worst case performance. Predicting worst case may be difficult on complicated architectures and leading to overly pessimistic estimates erring on the side of caution. Now, if you are a very experienced designer, okay, then you can minimize this error. Otherwise, worst case design may actually increase the cost. But the safest bet for a real time system is to do a worst case design. Reactive computation means that the software executes in response to external events. Now, these events may be periodic. In each case, scheduling of events to guarantee performance is possible. We have already studied scheduling policies. But events may be aperiodic as well. 
in which case the maximum event arrival rate must be estimated in order to accommodate worst case situations. So, this becomes an estimation problem. You have to have a prior estimation of the worst case event arrival rate. Okay. Then only you can have provision for your time such that this aperiodic task constraints of aperiodic tasks can be met and that may also lead to choice of an appropriate processor because you cannot choose any processor arbitrarily. Try to understand this because if you know the worst case arrival time for aperiodic processors as such that the time budget which will be available for aperiodic processes after servicing your periodic processes will not be sufficient to meet the demands of a periodic process that essentially means that your processor is taking more time for executing periodic tasks. Possibly you need to go for a faster processor so that your time budget for a periodic tasks can be increased taking into account the worst case arrival rate. Okay. So, if you are do doing that, what you are trying to ensure? You are trying to ensure that your system will not fail even under worst case computational load. Size and weight are also an issue because if I am using say a single board computer, then what should be its weight? Okay? What should be its size? So, many embedded computer is physically located within larger artifacts having to fit into what we call interstices among mechanical components. So, the size that mechanical components allow you have to meet that requirement. Therefore, it is, it is not always a functional requirement, but it is a non-functional physical requirement. So, you might need to design PCBs putting together your digital circuits, analog circuits and power circuits in such a way that its footprint is minimum okay? and so that it can be put into the space which your mechanical design permits. In transportation and portable systems, weight may be critical for fuel economy or human endurance. So, an example is a mission critical system has much more stringent size and weight requirements than the others because of its use in a flight vehicle. Okay, because if I if am using a heavy computer, weight is more for fly by wire system, then the fuel consumption also increases. Okay. So, weight as well as the size, they are although non-functional requirements, but play a major role for design of an embedded systems and they are not of relevance at all when I am designing a desktop computer or a supercomputer for that matter. Then becomes safety and reliability. Some systems have obvious risk associated with failure. So, for example, for a flight, if there is a failure of the electronics, then there is a huge loss of life and property. Okay. So, there has to be uh, decisions. So, let us look at it. A design decision is for minimizing such risks. Okay. So, how do you do that? You can use redundancy. Typically, you use redundancy or distributed consensus protocols. That means, there are multiple computers uh, located maybe at different sites doing the same computations and then you take a consensus among them to take a decision. Typically, your uh, space flight controls implement this kind of a redundancy with a consensus scheme. In fact, if there is a, there is a failure, there may be a, another computer taking over the, the function of uh, one of them or if there are two, then one may fail, another can continue and both of them can be synchronized with respect to the computation. But the whole problem is that the moment you bring in redundancy, the cost would increase. Okay, the moment you bring in redundancy, the cost is increased. So, this is an example of a trade-off. You can create a fail-safe system, but fail-safe system would be a costly system. So, you have to look at the business model or the cost model for deciding on whether you would make the system truly fail safe or not. And there are many embedded systems which are expected to work under harsh conditions. Okay. So, excessive heat, 
there can be vibration, shock, lightning, power supply fluctuations, water, corrosion, fire and general physical abuse. So, how does these affect the design? These should affect the design in terms of choice of components. You would like to make choice of components whose operating temperature range would be higher. Okay. There are various semiconductor components which are conditioned for operating over higher temperature ranges. So, that choice of component is one. Another very important thing is of packaging the components because your package should be made in such a way that internally components becomes shock resistance, vibration proof as well as maybe waterproof. If you look at the problem of your sensor networks and your sensor nodes being dropped at various places in, in a forest to track animal, it has to be weather resistant. Okay? It cannot be affected by uh, your rains, cannot be affected by really sunlight. So, there has to be mechanisms that is packaging has to be built in such a way that you can make your embedded system operative under harsh conditions. And this actually is what leads to what we call the cost sensitivity. There have stringent requirements, but cost is almost always an issue because I cannot build something which is highly reliable, robust, meeting all the requirements and at the same time highly costly. So, what we say the variable design margin okay, to you have to use to permit trade off between product robustness and aggressive cost optimization. If you look into it, this is this leads us to a very interesting issue. The issue is what? That if you have a product, you obviously you will not accept a product if it does not satisfy the functional requirements. Okay. But satisfying functional requirements does not give you a guarantee about the quality of the product. Okay. A product can become more robust if you have taken care of all these conditions. The moment you are taking care of all these conditions, the cost of the product can go up. Okay. So, the point is the trade off between product robustness and aggressive cost optimization. Somewhere these two things have to meet depending on the perception of the market. So, overall from the systems point of view, so the key issue comes up is end product utility, system safety and reliability and the aspects involved in controlling physical systems as well as power management. Because so far we were looking at primarily the issues related to processing elements. Now, we are extending these considerations for the complete system as a whole. So, utility of the end product is a goal when designing an embedded system and not, not the capability of embedded computer. This is something very, very important. Okay. So, uh, so, what we say that it really does not matter. In fact, uh, whether your uh, car is using a 16 bit processor or a 8 bit processor, the issue is whether that processor meets the demands of the car electronics or not. Okay. Using a 16 bit processor can be simply an advertisement uh, for the company and not really in terms of utility of the product. So, these issues are also important not only for designing, but also for appreciating and choosing a product and product specifications. So, software is used to coordinate the mechanisms and define their functionality, this is obvious and computer hardware is made available as infrastructure to execute the software and interface it to the external world. In fact, why it is important? Because your functional requirement is translated through the software. Okay? So, your software specifications will be such that it will actually decide the hardware okay? because your software and the timing constraints actually decides the hardware. So, the utility comes from there itself. So, whether it is a 8 bit processor or a 16 bit processor depends on what are the functionalities that are being supported in the software for the particular embedded appliance. Okay. And uh, total functionality is obviously therefore, the paramount utility. So, when we are looking at the overall system and looking at the design of the overall system, so what is important is that we are critically defining the functionalities functionalities is getting translated to specification of the software 
constraints on the software and that constraints would lead to actually the hardware platform on which the software has to be supported and that would dictate the choice of the processor. Okay? And on the basis of the choice of the processor, we also have other non-functional requirements which also becomes important, your power budget, your cooling requirements, cost, etc. Safety and reliability is not just the reliability of the processor. We had talked about the reliability of the processor. So, one way of increasing the reliability of the processing element to use redundant number of processing elements. That means, we may duplicate and use uh, duplication to, to make the system fault tolerant. But when we are looking at the system as a whole, if we have to optimize on the cost, okay, we may like to use other mechanisms to take care of the faults okay, and the reliability. So, a mechanical safety backups are activated when the computer system loses control in order to safely shut down the system operation. Okay. So, basically you ca can consider a simple example that when all the controls were being operated by the computer, so it is an automated control. So, if the computer detects a failure, if it can flag that failure, so some part of the control can be taken over by the human operator. So, you can have a manual control along with a partial computer control. So, that way you are building in a redundancy into the system without increasing the cost. Typically in your car electronics, okay, in the majority of the cases when it is an uh, auto gear that means your uh, fuel injection is automatically decided, your gear change is automatically decided, they all of these cars also have a manual mode. Okay. So, manual mode can take over when there is a failure for this electronic uh, part or the embedded part. And uh, then if you are controlling the physical systems, the analog inputs and outputs must be transformed to and from the digital signal levels. Okay. So, significant current loads may need to be switched in order to operate motors, light fixtures and other actuators. All these requirements can lead to a large computer circuit board dominated by non-digital components. Okay. So, then designing and putting this because switching also would introduce what noise as well. Okay. So, there has to be mechanisms built in to take care of these issues because you are actually controlling the actuators. Okay. So, you may like to separate out these two electronics, okay. whether you put them into a single box or a separate box, plug it in, how the system engineering would be done with respect to these requirements becomes an issue. Because if you look into it, there are two competing constraints. We would like everything to be put onto a single PCB so that your size becomes minimum. But at the same time, the moment I put everything onto the same PCB, I may actually affect the reliability of the operations because noise and the heat generated in the process in maybe a non-digital part of the circuit can affect the other part. Okay? So, these issues have to be dealt with. And uh, when you have the actuators, say this is an example where you have got what we call say the smart sensors and actuators, where the sensors and actuators contain their own analog interfaces, power switches and small CPUs that may be used to offload interface hardware from the central embedded computer. So, that means you are having a small system where your complete actuator electronics is separated out, your sensor electronics is separated out. And you are using a standard communication link, maybe a USB port to communicate between the sensor and the actual embedded computer. Okay. So, that is exactly the issue of packaging which comes up. Fine. And uh, so, this says that this brings us the additional advantage of reducing the amount of system wiring and number of connector contacts by employing an embedded network rather than a bundle of analog wires. Okay. So, the whole PCB design and packaging becomes much more streamlined and it is more modular. Okay. So, if you imagine your concept of building up a system by putting together different modules, 
this strategy makes the system more modular. What is also an advantage of this modular design? Advantage is that if you have designed this kind of smart sensors, they become reusable. That means you are using in this in product 1, but these sensors or actuators becomes reusable in product 2 as well. So, this is the basic design trade off which you have to keep in mind. Obviously, when you are using multiple modules, your space requirement increases, size requirement increases. Okay? But can you really do an engineering design such that size requirements becomes same, almost same, okay? but still you have got a modular components to play with. So, obviously, if we come to this uh, point, what we have understood is that for an embedded system, we have got functional as well as non-functional requirements. Functional requirements is output okay, as a function of input, but from the design philosophy which we have looked at, that non-functional requirements also play a very critical role. Okay. So, time required to compute output, this is a performance requirement, then size, weight, etcetera, power consumption, reliability. So, all these are non-functional requirements, but these non-functional requirements play a major and a crucial role for designing an embedded system, because a function can be very easily implemented. Okay? So, the challenge is not that of just implementing a function, but that of implementing a function satisfying the constraints of non-functional requirements as well as optimizing many of the non-functional parameters. This is precisely the design challenge of an embedded system. So, what is the life cycle of development? So, this is a very standard product life cycle that we can look at. Okay. So, development, so this takes place in a concurrent process, what we talk about a product design and manufacturing process, production, deployment, support, upgrades and retirement. So, this is how it goes through a product life cycle. So, uh, so when you are doing the design, there is a requirement that whether you are keeping in mind the different aspects of product life cycle as well or not. Try to think in these terms in a very simple way, when you are doing a concept development for a product, whether you would like to use a flash memory okay, as part of the embedded system. Flash use a flash instead of a must ROM may lead to additional cost, but that would give you an opportunity to provide upgrade subsequently. So, you have to understand whether such an upgrade would be required or not, what is the lifetime of the product. Okay. So, that motivates your decision about using whether a flash or that of a ROM, not just the functional requirements. So, product life cycle or conceptualization of a product life cycle also is an important aspect. So, that really leads to what we call a component selection. So, embedded system may be more application driven than a typical technology driven. So, you have more leeway in component selection. That component acquisition cost can be taken into account when optimizing system life cycle cost. For example, cost of a component generally decreases with quantity. So, design decisions for multiple designs should be coordinated to share common components to the benefit of all. That means, you can look at multiple products using similar components. So, the cost will go down okay, and that would benefit the whole process. The other thing is that when you are putting the product onto the market, the issue of maintenance, the logistics and the repair. Okay? So, if we want it to be repairable, then you have to look at whether the spares should be available, whether the manpower to repair them should be available. Can we make a design which can be repaired if required by the user himself? Say for example, if you look into a design of your cell phone, the SIM card if it goes bad, it can be easily replaced by the user himself. You do not need a, a technical manpower or technical setup to replace a SIM card. Okay? So, that means the whole and SIM card has got what? SIM card has got some part of the functionality as well as a memory that your cell phone offers. So, you have seen that how it has been partitioned. 
the actual processing elements and the and the memory part is in the cell phone which cannot really deal with but there are other parts which is vendor or the service provider specific has been separated out and separated out in such a package which can be easily replaced and modified so that is basically a design aspect guided by the logistics requirement okay uh, first repair time may also imply that extensive diagnosis and data collection capabilities must be built into the system now these if it is built in you can have a technical manpower to repair and design such a system there may be on the other hand very low cost systems where you would not like any repair to take place you would like it to be used and thrown away okay so then there those systems should not have any support for diagnostic port if you remember the organization that i showed you one important aspect was the diagnostic port if you have designed a system which is to be used and thrown away then diagnostic port really has no role so that electronics can be straight away eliminated saving cost as well as space so maintainability is if we are looking at long systems lifetimes proliferations of design variations can cause significant logistics expenses that is if a component design is changed it can force changes in spare component inventory maintenance test equipment maintenance procedures and maintenance training and each design change should be tested for compatibility with various other system configurations and accommodated by the configuration management database typically you should have so let's look at a car okay now as uh, a different models of the car are coming in your electronics also changes but change of the electronics cannot be such that it makes the older models incompatible because if there is a failure either you have to support the old spares the old electronics or else you have to make the current electronics compatible with the old models so that they can be plugged in if it is required so whenever there is an improvement or the modifications this maintainability of the product becomes an important issue so obviously the life cycle is related to the business model so you have got design as well as the production costs design cost is non recurring engineering cost production cost is actual production cost and this point is that uh, uh, this non design costs are of major importance when few of a particular embedded system are being built okay when it's a very special purpose when it's a mass market okay uh, and so uh, production costs are important in high volume production because the design cost can be very easily offset over the number of products that are being made so the production of an individual unit becomes a critical component okay its bill of material then it becomes important as well as the cost of assembling it together okay so this nre cost and the production cost are the two determining factors in fact when we said that we are trying to talk about choosing a processor choosing a processor which is meeting all constraints but becoming costly what it means it means that your bill of material for the embedded system is increasing that go gets added into a production cost if you are using one or two versions or one or two or specialized embedded systems there increase of a cost of a individual processor may not play a very critical role okay and the cycle time is the time between identification of a product opportunity and product deployment and this is what is known as time to market and can be quite long for embedded systems but ideally today we won't like it to be long if you are long if you taking it long then you will be actually out of the market okay so but the key issue here is this is more of a uh, implementational aspect that electronic design may be most of the cases straightforward not if not straightforward it's doable but mechanical components and manufacturing process designs consumes the maximum time now what it comes to therefore is that you cannot really have a complete conceptualization development and production of an embedded system without ignoring the mechanical aspect of the design 
this is a very key observation that you should make after these discussions. Now, with this background of uh, design requirements and the design needs, we shall now start looking at actual design process. Okay? So far, what we have discussed? We have discussed uh, the steps involved in the design. We have discussed what kind of requirements to be satisfied by the design. Now, we shall start looking at the design process. The first step in the design process is that of the ability to express the design. If you cannot express the design, you cannot do the design. Okay? So, you need what is called design languages. So, you use design languages to model your systems. Okay? So, if you are using this kind of design languages, they are useful across several levels of abstraction and understandable within and between organizations. And another very important uh, advantage of using design languages is they provide unambiguous specification of the system. Because if there is an ambiguity in the design, then you cannot translate the design into a executable component. So, there are many such modeling tools and languages which are being used today for embedded systems. We shall first look at UML. UML is a tool for specifying the system in an object oriented fashion and it provides primarily a graphical view of the system. So, this is a typical representation of an UML object. Now, please keep in mind that UML was primarily developed for designing software intensive systems. Okay? And uh, in UML, the objects corresponded to the physical objects which can have a software implementation or realization. But since the objects can be mapped to a physical object, then when you are talking about an embedded system design, there is really no conceptual difference between a hardware object or a software object. You can actually refer to hardware components and object because all such objects will have a hardware realization along with a software wrapper around it. Take a simple example of this UML object which is a display. Now, if you look at a display, display has to be a physical display, a physical LCD display which is an array of 2D pixels okay? so, and 2D array effectively. An array to the array means it will have the memory locations. You have to write data onto the memory locations. And so, logical representation of pixels is array of pixels. And what are the different elements which can be displayed on the pixels, menu items? So, these are what? These are basically fields of the object. Okay? And this is a display. And this is a specific instance of a display. That is why we are referring it to by name D1. So, the basic concept is that I can group all kinds of say displays into a class called display. Okay? So, all these displays will have a support for this array of pixels that is will that will map to the memory that is actually realized in hardware. Your software when it is writing anything onto the display is writing onto that memory. So, that writing or whatever you do will be done through the methods which actually would form part of this class itself. So, this class is actually representing the class corresponding to this object is actually representing what? The display as a physical element along with the software which is wrapped around it so that you can use that hardware element in your design. This is the basic motivation of using UML as a design tool for embedded system. Okay? So, this is uh, what we have showing this object name D1 because it is an instance of the class called display. Display is a class name and these are the attributes of that class. Okay? So, if we now go to the complete class, the class would be represented through this. These are basically the methods. So, mouse click or draw box. Now, these would translate to what? how actually the data has to be written onto the memory so that these patterns can be displayed or this mouse click can be recorded. So, you are again looking at the basic concept of modularization. We are modularizing these components. 
both hardware and software modularized into a class and class instances. So, you have got the complete encapsulation, encapsulation and hiding of details not only of the software, but as well of hardware features. Because you may have a particular display, that display instance can be an LCD display instance, another display can be a CRT display, the actual scheme being used for writing the data onto them may be different, but that details is being hidden to a user of the display class. So, these are uh, basically the things. Now, there would be relationships between the objects, association, aggregation, composition and generalization. Association means object communicate, but one does not own the other. Okay? Aggregation means it is a complex object, which is made of several smaller objects. Composition is aggregation in which owner does not allow access to its components. And generalization define one class in terms of the other. Please try to keep in mind these relationships, because they will be used actually for describing variety of embedded architectures. So, this is an example of a derived class, simple class inheritance. So, you have a base class and you have got a derived class, derived class inherits attributes operations of base class. Okay. So, this way you can build on the specializations. So, if you look into here, I had a display, this was a base class and on the basis of which I can have a specialized black and white display, I can have a color map display. Okay. These basic functionalities can be defined here and then I can inherit and do what in this case? Override maybe some of these functions, add on attributes. So, this is a base class and you have the basic derived classes, black and white display and the color map display. You can have multiple inheritance. So, you can have an LCD display and the speaker both inherited together to form your multimedia display. So, links and associations actually show how objects and classes are interrelated. Link describes relationships between objects and association describes relationship between classes. These are the two different things. Objects are what? Instances of the classes. So, when we talk about the link, we talk about in relationship between instances. When you talk about association, we talk about relationship between the classes themselves. So, if you look into here, you are talking about an object called message set, which consisting of two messages and these are the two instances of the messages, okay? the two messages of two different message length. And this is an example of an association and what does that mean? The message set is a class, message is another class and the message set can contain, one message set can contain 0 to many okay, messages okay, for an instance. So, 0 star means actually 1 to many. Fine? So, this contains many such message streams. So, this is basically containing the message sets. Okay. Now, there is also a concept of what is called stereotype. So, if you have a particular kind of a class okay, and uh, so, if you have a class and you want to indicate an object that it belongs to a particular stereotyped class, you would indicate by this symbol. Okay. So, an object belonging to a system class can be indicated by this symbol. Next, so what we have got so far? We have got therefore, a mechanisms to specify the individual components of a design. Because your design, I said consisting of objects, because any embedded system design will be built around components. Each component, what I am telling, is getting encapsulated into a class and a class instance. So, we have got a language for basically describing the components which goes into building an embedded system. Fine? So, primarily that is a static part of an embedded system. The other part would be 
the dynamics fine. So, dynamics is captured by behavioral description. So, primarily the two basic tools which are used are state transition diagram and a sequence diagram. So, state machines it is nothing but your finite state machines which we have used for any digital circuit design. So, here you have got a state, a state will have a unique state name and there would be a transition from a state to another state and that is described uh, by this kind of a diagram and that specifies behavior of the system. So, behavioral descriptions are written as event driven state machines because if you look into it the control algorithm which is running in an embedded system is nothing but a state machine. If you remember when we discussed tiny OS, we said tiny OS is organized as a collection of concurrent FSMs. So, its behavior is nothing but a collection of finite state machines. So, if we are designing the behavior, how to express that design? We can express the design by drawing a finite state machine which would become an unambiguous specification of the behavior of the system. So, one state machine may not aspect, uh, capture all aspects of the behavior. So, actually my system be described in terms of a collection of such finite state machines. An event can come from inside or outside the system. So, events can be signal, these are actually using your um, UML terminology, signal, call, timer. So, signal is an asynchronous event, so it can be an interrupt call is a synchronized communication just like a procedure call, timer is in a sense asynchronous, but why it is not purely asynchronous? Because it will occur only at an expiry of a time, so it is synchronized with the clock. So, a signal event is uh, you can declare a signal event. So, if you, if you see here we are using this concept of prototype. Okay. So, I am considering this as a example of a signal event mouse click. So, mouse click event has got attributes okay, which are left or right button and x y position, okay, which button being pressed at what position it is being pressed. And if this is an event, this event actually can cause transition. So, a behavior of a system that if the mouse is clicked, you make a transition from state A to state B, it is being described through this state transition diagram. Similarly, if you look into here, it is a draw box. Draw box is a call event, okay. it is a method call. So, draw box is a call event. So, from C to D transition is taking place when this call event is actually activated. Timer event is when the timer generates a signal at expiry of a time value. So, that is being represented by this value. So, let us look at a complete state machine. So, what we have shown here is this input and output norm. Okay? So, this is an input and what will be the output at a particular state. This is a start state, typically in UML we indicate these as a start, start state. And what we say that if it is a mouse click, if the input, input is a mouse click, what is the output? Output is a call event, say find region. So, you are finding a region where the mouse click has actually taken place. Okay. So, with respect to that, you know the region would correspond to a menu. Okay. So, you actually generate the menu item. So, you say that which menu, this is the output at this point. And when it is clicked, that call menu, okay, when the menu is selected, that is basically the function which goes to the called menu item and that is that can lead to the end state. This is the termination state because I am showing a a small part of a finite state machine. So, it goes to the termination state. So, there can be another way that region drawing and find objects. So, if I found an object, so highlight the object, an object gets highlighted because if I am processing a drawing. So, I am taking a mouse to highlight a drawing. So, you can see that system behavior is getting described through this kind of a state machine. Okay. The other way of doing at it or uh, uh, specifying the behavior of the system is via sequence diagram. So, sequence of operations over time and relates behaviors of multiple objects. So, if you look into here, the basic sequence diagram syntax is 
that these are the objects okay with each object i associate a timeline okay and from an object effectively what is happening this is actually you can look at it as a event event generated at the mouse object okay and this event has occurred at a time instance which is given by this uh, length along the time axis and that takes you to the display okay so if you remember the mouse click was a method in the display object because this event from mouse if we have this object this uh, event actually has to be processed by the method here so methods are nothing but what the message is being passed by the object so this object will actually invoke the mouse click method on the display object to process the mouse click okay so that's why it is shown in this fashion following this these are the two actions which take place okay so which menu it finds out which menu is and then accordingly it makes a call menu so this is a sequence diagram which where explicitly temporal ordering of the activity okay has been shown in a state transition diagram the dependence of the states and the state transitions on your input events as well as the output actions are being shown so what we have seen so far therefore the design issues of an embedded system and looked at uml as a design tool to represent design specifications in fact we have not looked at those aspects of uml by which we can express the architecture of the system we have just seen the components the modules we have just seen how to specify the behavior how to specify the temporal ordering of the actions through a sequence diagram but we have not seen how to model an architecture how to model concurrency how to specify the concurrency related constraints for the system that we shall look in in the next class and once we see uml as a tool what it enables us it enables us to just to describe the design specification fine right? so design constraints once you have that then actually the translation process would start there are other design tools as well okay for the purpose of system modeling we shall also look at them in the next class